So good morning, everyone. This is the House Healthcare Committee. It's Wednesday, March 10th. It's uh, just a minute or two after 8.30 in the morning. And this morning we are continuing our to hear testimony on House Bill 210, our health equity bill, to address issues of health disparities. And um, before we get going, let me remind uh, everyone that our goal this morning is to hear from our witnesses. Uh, questions for our witnesses are appropriate as clarifying questions uh, and not to question the testimony of our witnesses. So I will keep an eye on that. Uh, but we are very fortunate to have a number of uh, folks who have agreed to some on very short notice to join us this morning, particularly to help us understand uh, issues of health disparities within the uh, native uh, indigenous communities of Vermont and, and elsewhere for folks who are living in Vermont. Uh, also to give us some feedback on the uh, provisions in the bill, uh, House Bill 210. I would say at this point, we've had some discussion about modifying our approach uh, based on testimony we've already heard. We're going to hear further testimony this, later this morning for some further feedback on uh, how to move forward. And uh, I will be working with uh, a group of, I will be working to try to create a new draft that can be shared with the committee uh, as soon as possible, given the time frame we have. Uh, but with that, I would like to particularly uh, welcome uh, Judy Dow. Uh, Judy, thank you for joining us this morning. I'm going to welcome you and ask you as part of your comments to our committee to uh, introduce yourself further. And uh, we're pleased that you were able to join us this morning. So let me turn the, turn the committee attention over to you, Judy. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> so uh, introducing myself, I guess, um, thank you first for inviting me to give input. And you've brought up some interesting issues that I'd like to address. Um, I've, I actually lived in Chittenden County um, for um, my entire life. Um, a documented 15 generations of my family have lived through, scattered throughout Burlington, Essex, and Williston. And um, my family was the last family to live and farm at the Ethan Allen Homestead. Um, <clears throat> I am currently the executive director of Gadakana. Gadakana is a native organization that funds um, and cares for indigenous women and their families to help them self-determine a good path in life. And I have a lot of things to say, so I've written them down. I hope you don't mind that I'm going to read them to you. Okay. That's fine. It might also be, we would welcome you sharing your written, your written comments as well, if you feel like you can do that later. Okay, thank you. Um, cultural humility is so important for medical doctors and others like legislators to learn. But increasing the hours from 10 to 12 hours to include two hours of cultural competency training is by far not sufficient. One can hear about cultural competency and think they know it all, but until they develop cultural humility, they really don't know anything. The National Institutes of Health defines cultural humility as a lifelong process of self-reflection and self-critique, whereby the individual not only learns about another's culture, but one starts with an examination of her or his own beliefs and cultural identities. To ask them to get two hours of competency training every two years to renew their license is little to nothing. I, <clears throat> I would suggest additional hours in training. However, this I'm sure you already know, and I hope you are using it that, to get a foot in the door. There needs to be more time spent on this training, not only for medical people, but for legislators as well. This proposal, like many others in this state, presume the four recognized tribes are the only indigenous people in the state. This is not true. The Native American Commission is essentially the four tribes with some non-indigenous and a few Western indigenous people weaving in and out of their commis the commission throughout their terms. 
when the new public health equity bill commission is formed, it must equally include indigenous people not represented by the recognized tribe of which there are many. To not include them would be perpetuating the historical trauma already caused by this state for generations now. Additionally, native peoples such as Gadakana have been working to deal with the needs of indigenous people during this pandemic and other times of pandemics. Last year, we received $350,000 for COVID rapid response funding to be used from March 20th to March 2021 be used from March 2020 to March 2021 from various foundations. These funds have all been dispersed to assist indigenous people throughout New England, including Vermont. Our COVID-19 funding was used to respond to the many inequities encountered by indigenous people and were given to cover over 900 people in over 100 families. In addition, we assisted 110 elders. We are currently writing additional grants to assist these families for another year. We would ha be happy to share the data we collected in this past year with you. It appears you are lacking in data statistics around Native American people. We are providing aid to the families we work with for food, medicines, heat, rent, computers, and Wi-Fi for children to attend school in remote areas, winter clothing, and so much more. We we provided funding for childcare for single mothers working low paying essential jobs and walking sometimes as much as five miles a day to work and back again. We provided funding to elders in their 90s whose home became infested with rats because they lived next door to an unlicensed junkyard. These are just a few of the things the funding went to cover. We have also worked to build capacity within these families and communities to enable them to self-determine a path to better health. For instance, we provided each family with $50 to start a backyard garden, and we gifted each child, 91 of them, with a fishing pole to learn to fish. This allowed many children to provide fresh fish and vegetables for their family during the pandemic. We also remotely shared our lessons on traditional ecological knowledge, making movies to teach these families how to sustainably harvest. We created healthy events such as sacred runs to promote health, healthy exercise and pride in our families at times when depression was so prevalent. Additionally, we have created videos to teach our families about preservation of food, dehydration, canning, and freezing, and in many cases, purchase the canning jars and dehydrators needed to preserve their food. Diabetes rates are going sky high in these troubling, troubling times. It is a known fact that for Native American people, it's not a matter of if they will become a diabetic, but, but rather when they will become a diabetic. Native Americans do not have the enzymes to digest raw sugar. This is also true for those natives that suffer from lactose intolerance and alcoholism as well. The enzymes are just not there to help natives properly process raw sugar, milk, and alcohol. Gadakana is aware of this. We have programs that address these issues with our families. We work over five acres of garden to produce fresh vegetables for our people. Families sign up to work the gardens, receiving healthy exercise, good food, and while following socially distance gu distancing guidelines. We also have circle gatherings where women attend meetings to work on cultural projects such as beading, drum making, and making the regalia. And for, for those that need to be part of a sober and drug-free environment while working on NA and AA 12-step programs. It has been stated by the American Medical Association that the impacts of COVID-19 have been traumatic on Native communities. In many places, the data is not collected, and if it is collected, it's not made public. The higher the disparities in chronic disease, the more vulnerable people are to COVID-19. The Center on Dis Disease Control and Pen prevention in the U.S. has reported that American Indians and Alaska Natives are 3.5 times as likely to get COVID-19 as non-Hispanic whites and four times as likely to be hospitalized. We know this. We have seen this over and over again, and we work, put, we work to put a stop to this cycle. 
Emotional stability is also important to us. For the past year, we have given our nine staff all the assistance they need to maintain their salaries, even though their hours were reduced due to lockdowns and lack of social gatherings. We have adapted. We have been thinking outside of the box and we provide them with whatever they need to reach the families and the communities they work in. In addition, we have two staff meetings weekly to provide time for problem solving issues that have arisen due to COVID-19 inequities. We work diligently to support our families and help them to find a balance in an unbalanced world. I'm explaining all of this to you so that you understand the needs of Native people are different than those of other BIPOC groups. And since there is little to no data available, your bill needs to re reflect these differences. The health system in Vermont historically have not protected us. A system of care that should have protected our well-being have instead betrayed us. And it is not easy to find our trust back into a system that contains a perpetual acts of racism. I've learned this lesson loud and clear coming from the largest family targeted in the Vermont eugenics records. To pass this bill as if it is written will contribute to the historical trauma that you are trying to heal. It will totally erase, disposes, and invisibilizes many people not recognized by the state of Vermont. I recommend that this bill include a broader membership and should actively include Native Americans not part of the four recognized tribes to protect the full interest of all the indigenous people in the state. Thank you for your time. I greatly appreciate your sharing with us um, both information that we need to have as well as your recommendations. Uh, thank you. I'm going to uh, see if there are questions from knowing that you, you have a time commitment this morning. I appreciate you made yourself available this early and see if there are questions from other committee members. Uh, before you have to make your other commitment. Thank you. Uh, Representative, Representative Chena. Thank you, Judy, for coming today and fitting us in your busy schedule. Um, you mentioned the, um, the suggestion of adding some representation from, uh, from indigenous people who are not part of the recognized tribes or Beneke people who are not part of recognized tribes. Um, is there a specific way you might recommend we do that? Like organizations we might ask to appoint people, like how would, how would who would appoint those, those folks? Because the way the bill is structured now, the commission has one appointment and each tribe has an appointment. And uh, when the Racial Justice Alliance worked on the bill, we chose that approach because it was a starting point, knowing like we could do better, but how might we, you know, how might we, add some seats. Do you have any thoughts about who we would ask or who would make the appointments? I don't. Um, you, the state of Vermont um, has chosen to take um, the four tribes who formed an alliance early on to, to reckon, to be allowed to recognize themselves and others have tried and failed. So um, I'm not sure how exactly how organizations would be indeed be one way um, to recognize, but there are, are um, communities of indigenous people that have lived together for centuries um, and they should have the opportunity to be included in these, these bills that you're passing. And it's very um, exclusive to not include them. Um, and so I don't know um, other than um, asking for people to identify themselves, which in many times is the very people who did not want to identify themselves to be accepted by the commission, the current commission. Um, people have chose not to be recognized for many reasons. Um, it could be that they don't feel they don't need they know who they are. They don't need to be recognized by the government. Um, it could be in the case of the Winooski people where I, I live, um, 
it, it's these people were put on lists. They were the five main families that were targeted by the eugenic survey. And they believe putting their names on lists once again will make them target. Um, so there's a lot of fear out there and those fears need to be addressed. And so how you reach out to them, um, my only guess is, is that medical people know this in many cases because um, these people um, see their doctors. Their doctors know who they are. Their doctors know that they're suffering from diseases and ailments um, typical of, the, of those from um, Native American people. Um, thank you for answering that. I have some ideas, but I don't know if I'm going to share them now because I, we, you know, but maybe we could vet any of those ideas by you and other witnesses um, through email or phone, if that's okay. I'd be happy to read okay. them. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Um, and again, we would welcome being able to reach out to you uh, as we move forward with revisions to the bill based on your suggestions and suggestions from others. So thank you for that. I see Representative Goldman uh, has a question. Yes, and thank you for coming this morning. Um, you mentioned that medical providers may know who some of these people are. Um, would you be willing to share, not, not with giving away privacy or anything, at least the names of medical providers who might be contacts um, for us to try and find some people that might be, that might consider participating? Could, well, can, can I interrupt? It's, Pardon me, Judy, can I interrupt and just say that I'm going to ask that you not, we not ask to have any even medical providers identified on no, the no, screen no. this morning? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I'm not asking you to say the names by, okay. by far, but yeah, would you be willing to work with Brian, uh, Representative Chena or some people involved in the commission to help identify? That was, sorry, my question was unclear. Just want to make sure. Yeah, yeah, totally. So, um, my personal doctor for 35 years just retired. Uh, she's uh, Tayeno from Puerto Rico. And uh, she contacted me recently to see if she could help Gadakna in any way. And um, I think she would be an excellent resource. Um, she um, has worked within the Essex community for decades and has also taught at the UVM Medical School for decades. Um, and I think that um, she would be an excellent resource and I'd be happy to give you contact information. Great, thank you. And could I ask, uh, uh, Judy, if there is a, I'm sure that not everyone on this, um, not every one of us is uh, as fully familiar with Gadakna. Uh, and is there is there a way for members to access more information about the organization that you've told us so much about, uh, uh, in addition to being cut in touch with you directly? Are there is there another uh, is there another contact or so place where we could find information uh, to follow up? Yes, uh, Gadakna.org. It's G-E-D-A-K-I-N-A. Gedakna means our world, our worldview. Um, and um, we have posted there some of the videos I talked about, the training videos we've been doing during COVID to help our families. Um, not all of them are up there because people wanted to remain private. Um, but we even created videos on how to um, catch night crawlers for fishing for the kids. <laughs> so um, we did a lot of thinking outside of the box and some of the families actually fished daily for their food. The kids and the families had this really amazing connection as they went each day to fish for the food. Thank you. And I'll just note that on our current agenda, uh, Gadakna is listed uh, by name uh, and spelled, i pleased to say correctly. <laughs> so uh, thank you. So if we add .org, we would be able to actually find the website as well. Is that correct? Correct. correct. Okay. Okay. Um, it's a 20-year-old organization. It was started in Norwich, Vermont. 
um, and it still continues today. Great, terrific. Representative Peterson, I see you have your hand up. Yes, thank you. Um, I was just wondering if the folks you serve and the folks in your group, do you access the, the state's health care system? I mean, are you are they are they in the in the system in some way or no um i i have been told by several um organizations when i've applied by funding that they're only allowed to give funding to the four recognized tribes so i get no funding from the state currently i have an application in with um uh, vermont humanities um and that's that's it. I, I think I, I, I framed the question wrong. <laughs> what I meant is um, if, if folks get sick in your group, do they access uh, doctors, health care providers, the health care system in Vermont? That's what I was getting at. I just wondered if. In some cases, yes. Um, in some cases, no, because they don't all have insurance. Um, so there's. Um, a swapping of traditional ecological knowledge that often occurs over emails um, around um, medicines, um, plants that will assist them with colds and things like that. Okay, so you you try to do it in a holistic way rather than rather than access health care. Well, that's because we can't control whether they have insurance or not, whether they gotcha. can afford to go to a doctor or not. Um, but during COVID, we have um, uh, provided families with medical assistance to go to their own doctor. Okay, and, and, and have, have people reached out to the access groups in Vermont to find out if, if they can in fact get insurance or get care of some kind? I believe so. Um, I, um, I've talked to a couple of families in Vermont about um, um, different avenues they might pursue as an individual, not necessarily as a Native American. Right. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I realize your time is is getting tight. I'm wondering if, if well, I see Representative Black has a question. Let's, let's turn to her. This is a really quick question. Thank you so much for being here. I was wondering if um, the um, Vermont Department of Health had um, reached out or if you've been in contact with them regarding um, immunizations and, you know, utilizing your organization <laughs> to identify um, people at higher risk who might require immunization? No, they've not been in contact with me and I've only been in contact with them to get my shot, which is this afternoon. Um, the, the issue that I repeatedly receive or the concerns I repeatedly receive is that if we are not part of the four recognized tribes, we don't get assistance. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. And if, um, Judy, again, I know you need to go, uh, is, can you say something? I heard you say earlier, which one of the one of the issues is the continuing mistrust of uh, the state and and of healthcare providers, perhaps even in particular. Can you say some? Can you say more about how that becomes a barrier for some of the oh yeah that you are, that you work with in terms of accessing the healthcare system in Vermont. It's an immediate barrier for those who were severely targeted by the Vermont Eugenics Survey um, because their fears of getting recognized and fears of self-identifying as indigenous. Um, but it's not only that period of time. When President Johnson was in office from, from I think, 63 to 69, um, uh, he gave millions of dollars out for anyone who looked full blood, full blooded to be sterilized. And um, so people are aware of that, people are fearful of that. And then there's the Mount Sinai ruling, which continued 
well into the 80s um, where the medical center hospital um, determined if you, they chose a number, say it was 135, um, each hospital was different. Um, they, they would decide if um, you had four, you were, had three children, went into the hospital for your fourth child, they would take four children times your age. And if it came over 135, you left without a uterus. Um, so in 1980 in Burlington, that happened to my sister. Um, we, when we married, I came from a family of five girls. When we married, we quickly took our husband's names to protect ourselves. But in my sister's case, she took her husband's name and her husband was also in the, listed in the eugenics project. So there's a continued fear all the time. So amongst the people that I work with, many of them have home deliveries. I personally have helped to deliver my grandchildren um, because my daughter did not want to go to the hospital. So there's a lot of issues um, that stems from fears that it never stops. It never stops. And so you constantly have to hide and you constantly have to deny your heritage. Thank you. I can only imagine that it's painful to have to recount these issues publicly over and over, but important for us to know. And I know that you've just barely touched on the long, long history uh, that has led to the fears uh, that you've identified. I, I would, at, the, at this point, uh, is there any final comment that you would like to make? I do realize that you have a commitment and need to, need to leave. But if you have any final comment, I would welcome it. And, and then thank you for being with us. Well, I, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. I thank you because um, the untold story of these people is, is seldom heard. And my father had always said to me, I can't believe people pay you to talk, I'd pay you to shut up. And the reason, <laughs> the reason he would say that to me is because he was fearful of what I was gonna say and how it might impact others. Um, so he's passed now. And um, I think of that every time I speak out. <laughs> Oh. Well, on, let me say as the chair of the House Health Care Committee, I appreciate your willingness and courage to speak out and uh, know that it is being heard and uh, has an impact as we think about how to move forward on this important bill. Thank so, you. Thank you for being with us this morning. And uh, again, our deep gratitude for your willingness to be here. Thank you. Good luck with the process. Yes, well, thank, thank you. Thank we, you, Judy. We appreciate that. Thank you so much. Okay. Um, we are going to continue in hearing from uh, witnesses from the Native community, and I'm pleased to be able to welcome uh, uh, Chief Don. Stevens from the Nolhagen Band of the Kusakabnaki Nation. Uh, Don, uh, welcome to the House Health Care Committee. Uh, let me welcome you as the chair of the House Health Care Committee. And I realize and to acknowledge that you are making time in your, in your busy schedule of other work that you have in the world. Uh, but this is important work I know to you. Uh, and so thank you for joining us this morning. And with that, again, I welcome you to do further introduction of yourself. Um, and thank you, uh, thank thank you for you. joining us. Can you, can you hear me all right? I, I believe we can, yes. Great. Um, yes, and I would appreciate as well if questions could be asked afterwards because I have to also uh, get back to work at, uh, when I'm done. Uh, I want to thank you for uh, inviting me here to testify. Uh, I'm not going to go into too much. I'm Don Stevens, uh, Chief of the Nolhegan People, uh, Abenaki Tribe. Most people know me. Uh, I've been around the State House a few times. 
Uh, people are pretty aware that my family was caught up in the eugenic survey as one of the primary targets. So, I mean, we all know about the fear of uh, native people around medical professionals, but I wanna to talk to you in a different light. Um, I, I agree with Judy that resources are, are important. I mean, I wish we had $350,000. Um, you know, I, I was able to get $117,000 from the state of Vermont in the last two weeks of December to purchase some food cards for our citizens because they had to use the money or lose it. We, we were an afterthought more than we were a beginning thought. And I'm trying to work with the state now on COVID uh, situations. As you know, uh, the governor and Mark Levine has stated that BIPOC people are kind of at 9% when it comes to getting vaccines where others have gotten about 20%. And I'm trying to find ways to reach out to our people to find out what the problem is, right? As most people know, uh, I, I, maybe they don't know, but I was in the first trials of the AstraZeneca uh, vaccines because I wanted to make sure to be a example to our people. And we have other people here that also wanted to make sure to try to lead the way now to, to say it's okay to be working with medical professionals. It's okay to work with the state of Vermont. We're in a different era now than, than our ancestors and we're, we need to move forward if we wanna be able to protect our people. So I just, I just wanna say that my relationship with the state is the partnership one. Uh, and I look forward to those partnerships. The problem that we see from healthcare is I'll give you an example. My son would have turned 35 two days ago. He died from an overdose from mental health issues. My daughter who was, went to the hospital at one point for uh, a broken leg and also from mental health issues. And the problem lies in that if there are no health care, they go to the emergency room. They don't have the health care, so there's no negotiation. They walk out of the emergency room with a $20,000 bill, which follows them throughout their life, which hinders them from being able to have good credit, what hinders them from being able to buying a house, uh, able to get access to vehicles. So, and that's not just Native people. That's people who cannot afford healthcare, I mean, if they're lucky enough to get Medicaid or Medicare, they, they're at least able to offset those bills. But there are many people who are caught in between and don't have that affordable healthcare because nobody can afford $800 a month for COBRA. So they, they don't go to the hospital until it's absolutely necessary, a life and death situation. And then they end up with thousands of dollars of bills. And then, like I said, that, that, that keeps them in poverty forever because they can't afford it. We're not even able to access Indian healthcare services like federal tribes do. Uh, so we don't have that option. What I'm hoping with this bill is potentially finding a way to create affordable healthcare for our people, either help them find ways to uh, either get them into the system where they can be covered, uh, which ultimately helps the medical centers who have to absorb some of this money that are not being paid and other rate payers. It also provides healthy access or access to medical care. Do our people use uh, traditional medicines and plants? Yes, but they also have to access healthcare. We are, I, when I was part of the uh, Vermont health uh, assessment that was done, um, it showed that we had uh, a significant amount of health disparities along the lines of diabetes, heart disease, mental health issues. Um, and I was part of the, the, the health improvement plan to try to address those things. Uh, but I'm not sure where that ever went. I know the state of Vermont was trying to recognize those disparities and trying to help uh, provide avenues for people um, to, uh, to get the help they need. 
And I bring up those cases about my kids, which is very personal because I lost one of them. And I almost lost the second one. So it's very, this healthcare is very important to me and there's nothing I could do as an, because they were adults to help them because I couldn't cover them under my health care. And they didn't have access to their own. Uh, and I, and I, uh, I don't say these things lightly from a personal standpoint. I mean, I'm, I, I'm just telling you from my heart that we have health disparities. It's known, there, there's no secret. I mean, there's statistics out there that show that we're, we have health disparities, that we don't have the access, but they compound. You know, people who don't have dental care, their teeth are rotting in their head, which causes infection in their mouth, which causes problems with their body. We have no access to health care. Even people on Medicaid, uh, you know, they'll pull the teeth when they can, but there's nothing to prevent them from getting rotten and sick. Uh, a lot of my people are from Northeast Kingdom. They have a hard time getting access to care, whether it be transportation, uh, whether there be health clinics around that will actually even accept them. People don't want to accept our people without insurance. You walk into a business that's a for-profit company and say, I want help. And they say, give me an insurance card. And you say, I don't have one. Yeah, okay. You know how that goes, right? Because the first thing they do is ask you, what's your insurance? They do a health screening before you even have an appointment. And then it's getting to those appointments. So I, I'm just trying to say that this is a bigger issue. And uh, I also want to address about the, uh, the, the state tribes. I don't want to get into all that mess, but uh, the Commission on Native American Affairs was set up to support people who were recognized, but also non-recognized people. I mean, if you look at the charge of the Vermont Commission on Native American Affairs, one of the charges is health care, social and economic. So there is an avenue. Uh, you don't have to reinvent the wheel. There is an avenue for the uh, to be able to get information from non-recognized uh tribal people. The, the biggest problem from the commission standpoint, it's just unfunded. You can't work on healthcare issues. You can't work on social economic issues. You can't work on anything when all you get is maybe gas money, right? So I think the state of Vermont really has to invest in the tribes, but also the commission. And, and, and we have no full-time representation. I'm speaking to you today from work. We have nobody in full-time positions that can do this testimony, can work on health issues, can work on social issues, can work on being a resource to everyone. We've been trying for years. There's a lot of people that um, are, are part of other disadvantaged communities who have that national backing, you know, that can provide lobbyists and can provide full-time positions to be able to work with you. Uh, I, that's not a bad thing. I, I'm glad they have that. I'm just saying the Native community has no one uh, representing us on a full-time basis. And that's why we, we struggle. And you see the same people on 20 boards because it's, it, I almost feel it's like the legislators because, you, you know, it, you either have to be independently wealthy, own your own business or not working in order to be a legislator because no employer is going to give you four months off to be able to go and, and serve are very rare that an employer says, I don't need you for four months, go ahead and serve the state of Vermont. Uh, so I'm saying is that we don't, even in our position, our employers aren't saying, go ahead and spend all kinds of time doing something different than what I'm paying you for, right? So I, I think in order to change the dynamics of healthcare and change the dynamics of our social economic status, is that you have to invest in allowing those voices to be heard and to be able to be a participant. One of the issues that I've talked to people before, you create all kinds of bills with all kinds of boards, but they're all voluntary boards to advise, to look at things and people work. It's hard for us to sit on all these boards and panels that are created like with all these bills and have your employer say, it's okay, spend the time to do it, right? I, so I, I just want you to be aware that um, when you're creating these things, there needs to be more full-time 
funds to be able to have people in those positions to really do a good job. Uh, and uh, affordability is, is big. We already talked about the fear. There is a cultural understanding that needs to happen because there are a lot of people who do holistic medical care, uh, which is part of our culture, but you still need access to healthcare because we're in a modern time. I mean, we're not, there are people when they, when there's life and death situations are really sick, they're gonna go to the doctor. They're gonna go to the emergency room. But if they don't have that insurance, they're gonna eat, they're gonna be walking out of there with a $30,000 bill that they can't afford. Uh, so anyway, um, diabetes is huge. I, I work with these things, PTSD, <clears throat> health, just, just mental health status, especially through this COVID situation. We have elders locked up in their house that are alone and they, they can't handle the mental, they, I mean, they're, they're commu we're, we're community people. <laughs> we, need, we need human contact. Um, and part of my job as chief is to make sure to address those things uh, with all of our people uh, and try to help them. We have a food security program that tries to give nutritious foods to help change some of the health disparities, but it's all non-funded from the state. It's all volunteer. So I'm going to stop and, and I would rather you ask me questions than me just tell you things that probably you already know. But I do support this. I do support anything that you can do to improve our healthcare situation, including this bill. Uh, th thank you, Don. Um, let me... Uh open it up to further questions. And I recognize that you, again, are taking time away from your otherwise paid employment to join us here this morning. So we'll be respectful of your time. Uh, Representative China. Yeah, thanks. Um, thanks, Chief, for um, making time in the middle of your busy work day to come in. Um, I appreciate, you know, that the, the sacrifice people make when they have to leave work to come here. Um, it sounded like you were, it sounded like you were saying that there's more we could be doing than this bill, that, that this bill's a good step, but that there's more we could be doing to address health equity. And it sounded like you were speaking to this piece around, um, around like the financial barrier for people accessing the allopathic healthcare system or the, you know, the Western healthcare system. Um, you do, like, do you think it would, it would, um, that it would help health equity if there was like, I'm trying to say this in a way that's not so dramatic, but like, you, like if there was a universal healthcare system or something like that, like if, if, the, if, if healthcare was just provided, um, be, without this barrier of insurance, like, do you feel like there's some work we should be doing there in addition to this bill? Well, of, of course. I mean, that's the whole point. I mean, it's, it's not just related to, to native people, right? There are a lot more people other than native people that have health disparities, uh, including the black and brown community, you know, Asian, you know, uh, the migrants. There's a whole bunch of people who need access to healthcare. So whether it be a universal healthcare or someone being able to cover us under a state plan or extending Medicaid to, uh, to, our, to those people most vulnerable, uh, or even finding some way to help offset premiums so they can afford maybe the Catamount Health or whatever the programs are. I think anything you can do to allow people to be able to go to the hospital and get prescriptions and be able to get health care without coming uh, out with hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of bills, right? I mean, we all know that if you go into the hospital and have a heart attack and you don't have insurance, you might as well just not even dream anymore about having a house or dream anymore about being able, because that debt is going to be paid for the rest of your life. And, and you won't, and, and if you don't pay it, you have no credit. So you, you, you are stay, you stay impoverished because there's no way out of it. And most people who have good jobs, who can afford insurance, right? Uh, don't have that same issue. So I, I don't know if it's as well as Native people are afraid of health care. I, 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 I think there's a piece of that. But I think the majority is because we're already economically depressed and we don't have 
funds to be able to pay for, like, do you want uh, food or do you want to pay for uh, $200 or $250, uh, $100 a week for, for health care, right? I mean, you're going to eat first, right? And then you take your chances, right? Just, you know, whether or not you get sick. But as soon as you get sick, you're, you know that you will never have credit again because nobody's going to write that off completely. There is, that payment's going to hound you just like uh, educational bills uh, will hound you for the rest of your life if you can't afford them and you'll never have credit and, and you'll never have anything. So it's compounding the, the, the uh, disparities already because you're already disparaged, but then when you add this on top of it, it just keeps you down. It keeps you there. So anything the state could do to cover us under a state plan, you know, cover us under uh, some other program that the state could afford that would help, uh, I think it would save in the long run from all these, I mean, UVM lost $21 million. How much of that is non-payment of, of funds that they have to write off every year? I don't know, but I'm just saying it's something to look at, right? And that, Anyway, it's just my thoughts is I think if you had healthcare in some form or fashion, it would definitely help take people out of, um, it gives them a chance to be healthy and to survive and be put on maintenance preventative things instead of waiting until a crisis. Thank you. <clears throat> I, I think uh, your point is well taken that one of the largest health disparities in Vermont is between those who have access to health care through insurance and those who do not. Well, I also think, too, is that if my children had access to prescription drugs that would have helped them with their mental health issue, maybe one of them wouldn't be dead today. Yes. You know, I'm just saying that... Um, it's hard bearing a child. Yes. And, and it was all medical related. And you know, Bill, by working in mental health, behavioral health, and myself being at a mental health area, that that's very prevalent. And uh, yeah. Yeah. And let, let me again, just acknowledge how, how painful it must it is to share these very personal stories with us today but it yeah. needs to be said it's the truth it needs to come out i mean what you guys do are important it's not just whether you do a rate hike or you do something else this is sometimes life and death situations i mean these are dealing with real world problems and real world world people i mean not that rate hikes are good or bad but i'm saying is you're dealing with the lives of people that make a difference I mean, you made a difference in our lives already. Look at how far the Native people have come from the time that we've struggled all the way up to now. You guys do very important work. Uh, you know, I just want you to understand the other side of it, that what you do makes a difference. Um, and, and how you, and how you uh, make things happen for disadvantaged people or even people in general, is, is, it affects lives, which is a good thing. Right, so that's why I'm here testifying and telling you these personal stories. Anyway, I can be long-winded, so I apologize ahead of time. No, I appreciate, I deeply appreciate your sharing. Uh, and I, I guess I, I'm gonna take the liberty to say that uh, my calling you Don rather than Chief uh, comes from the fact that we had established a connection through our families uh, some years ago. Um, yeah. And so I, I mean no disrespect by not referring to you as chief. I'll refer to all of you. That's just a title. I mean, that means I'm Don. I, I'm, I'm, that's just something that is a part of what I do. And it's an elected position, just like somebody calling you representative. I mean, it's not, it doesn't define who you are. So that's why I refer to you as Bill or I refer to others. Yeah, or absolutely. Dan, you know, I don't, I don't care about titles. I don't care about what that, I mean, I do it because it represents our people and it's right. something I do. So never feel offended. I'm Don. I, that's what I was given my birth name and that's where I'll always be. So I just don't worry about the titles. Thank you. 
and uh, in the world of the small world of Vermont, uh, Don and I, having met through uh, my partner and my interest in uh, making connections to the Abnaki people of Vermont, then later discovered that we both had worked for the same mental health organization or that you work for and a place where I used to work. Uh, we happen to have that uh, serendipitous connection uh, just by chance. I'm at this point, uh, I don't see any other hands right now, but Don, thank you. I'm going to, uh, uh, again, appreciate your willingness to share such uh, difficult personal stories. I know it's important to you to share them and I appreciate that. Uh, and we're going to uh, look to hear from further witnesses. So thank you for joining us, Don. Well, thank you for allowing us to have a voice in this important topic, you know, and, and for those, especially of my citizens who can't speak on their own behalf, you know, it gives us an avenue to at least express to you the situation of our people and uh, our partnership with the state. So I, I hope to continue that partnership. I hope to continue to work with you to uplift everyone. So I just want to say thank you, Adio, Nana Walmazi, Oli So I hope you thank travel you, Don. well. Stay thank healthy you, Don. Stay healthy and safe. Thank you. Thank you very much. So with that, I'm going to turn to welcome uh, Beverly Little Thunder, who is with us. Uh, Beverly, we have not met in person previously, but I'm pleased to welcome you to the House Healthcare Committee as the chair of this committee. And again, uh, appreciate you making the time uh, to share with us your thoughts uh, and your experiences and those of those who are close to you as part of the native communities of Vermont. So I, I welcome you to give us more of an introduction of yourself. Uh, so I'm gonna turn it over to you. Welcome. Thank you, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, thank you. Um, well, my name is Beverly Little Thunder and I am from the Standing Rock Lakota Band uh, in North Dakota, uh, obviously not a tribe from Vermont. However, I have lived here for the last 17 years. And it is my hope that when I make a journey into the spirit world that I am buried here in Vermont. Uh, this is my home and it is land that I have come to love very, very much. And Part of that responsibility is being concerned with what is happening for all indigenous people in this state. And as a part of uh, the Native American uh, Commission on Native American Affairs, I work with the rest of the board to uh, see that things are implemented that will benefit all indigenous people. And as we talk about health disparities, we talk about financial assistance for those who are um, not of the wealthier echelon. Um, most Native people that I have encountered in the state do not have that extra $50 to even pay for a copay to go to the emergency room. Uh, they don't have that extra $20 to pay for a copay four times a month to go and have physical therapy to help heal something that physical therapy could heal rather than in undergoing surgery. Um, and the fear of debt, well, that's real, that is very real. Because if you have debt from medical bills hanging over, sometimes that's going to prevent you from even renting a place to live. It's going to affect your housing. Mental health care, you cannot go to someone, 
of your choosing to receive counseling, to receive mental health assistance, if you don't have insurance and the copay. So the two go hand in hand. So even if you are among the few who can afford to pay the outrageous amounts that you need to pay each month to ensure that you have some health coverage, most of the time you don't have the money to afford those co-pays. It's a matter of, do I get health care or do I feed my family? Do I pay for my housing? All of those are all intertwined. Dental care. We look at dental care as something um, that is meaning pulling your teeth out. Indian Health Service in other states does not have a solid plan for addressing dental care. In most cases, when you go to a dentist here in Vermont and you have a bad tooth, if you cannot afford the root canal, you can't afford the crown, you can't afford the thousands and thousands of dollars to replace that tooth, they jerk it. As an elder, as a 74 year old woman, I have great difficulty in chewing. I have begun losing weight because I have lost so many teeth and I cannot afford to go and have dentures. I cannot afford to go and have partials. I cannot afford to have implants. And so that affects my diabetes, that affects my high blood pressure, that affects all of my, my health care. Because most people don't realize that dental care is a part of the overall health of people. But we have a lot of elders who are malnourished and we see them every day, but it's not something that they're going to talk about. And so it's a, important when we're looking at health disparities that we consider that. Um, and in Vermont, everyone knows about the Abenaki people. Everyone knows that there are four bands that are recognized. But most people don't realize that there are a large number of non-Abenaki people who also live in this state, who are also struggling to make ends meet, to provide health care for their families. There are a large number of Abenaki people who are not part of those bands that are recognized. And they too their voices need to be heard. You know, I agree that with Dawn that creating boards and commissions are important, but they're impractical. They're impractical because if you don't give them the funds to be able to do the work that they're charged with doing, then they're not able to be effective. In our health disparities, we also have a large number of LBGT uh, native people and trans people who struggle to find adequate health care for their needs. And they too need to be a part of this conversation. They need to be heard, their voices need to be heard. There are many, many midwives in Vermont, but not many of them are indigenous. The indigenous midwives that there are, are lay midwives who don't get paid for their services. They might get a grocery card from the person that they've helped catch their baby, but they are not a part of a association uh, of midwives that provide services. And they can't go to some of these people because they don't have the money to do so. So, you know, it's a ongoing, and I'm sure that you're tired of hearing now that 
money. Money is the, the big uh, divider. There are those that have and those that have not. And among BIPOC people and Native people, there just is not the funding or the consideration given uh, to them for their health needs. And this affects not just the people that are alive today, it affects the people who are yet to come. You know, I heard Don talk about his son. I too am a mother who lost a child, not in the state, but in another state, to suicide because of lack of access to adequate mental health counseling and care. And so it's not just in the state, but here in Vermont, I have come to expect better. I have moved to Vermont because I felt that there were people here who were progressive enough to see the big picture, who were setting an example for the rest of the country, who cared about the people who lived in this state enough to take into consideration all aspects of the people who live here and their lives. And as you're considering this bill and going through and, and looking at it, I would ask that you consider everyone in this state, even those who are not recognized or who do not walk in the street saying, I am an indigenous person. And when we talk about indigenous people, let us not forget the migrant workers who are here. We did not put up that border. It was this country that put up that border. And those people that come here are just as indigenous as I am. And I think that it's something that we don't often give a lot of thought to, that they too need medical care. They have children and those children need medical care and oftentimes don't get it. And it's because of fear. There has to be a way we can provide medical care for them without asking, do you have a green card? Yes, I know it. There are those people who would say, well, we're not responsible for them. They should stay in their own country. Um, they need to open their hearts and open their minds, uh, open their eyes. Because these are people who keep this, this state moving. Our agricultural system would fall if we did not have people who wanted to come and do the work. And we owe it to them to provide medical care for them and for their children. So I agree with everything that Judy has said, and everything that Dawn has said. It's, it's crucial that we really look at the health disparities that are before us. And it's crucial that we craft a bill that's going to be inclusive and that's going to take all things into consideration. And I probably will lose a lot of people when I say maybe the higher ups should take a cut in their pay if we need money. Maybe some of those paychecks could be trimmed down a little bit so there's more money for those people who need health care. Because if you have healthy citizens in the state, you're going to have a healthy economy. And you're going to have a thriving state. Rather than having that divided state between those that have and those that have not. So thank you. Thank you for listening to the rants of this, this old woman who has, I have traveled all over the United States and lived in many Native communities. And this is a community that is now my home. And I take that responsibility 
very, very seriously. Salamia, thank you. I want to thank you for, again, making yourself available to us on really short notice, making the time available out of your day, which is filled with other important work as well, and sharing your experience uh, about making Vermont your home. Uh, thank you for making Vermont your home. Uh, it's good to have you here in Vermont as numbers of us have made Vermont our home. We have come to Vermont and made it home together. Uh, again, I'd like to, uh, again, respect your time, but also open it up to see if there are questions from committee members for you this morning. I'm gonna pause while people think about Uh, Representative Cordes. I don't have a question. I just want to thank you, grandmother. <laughs> yes. It's thank you. Thank you, Representative Cordes, uh, for acknowledging the presence of an elder with us. <laughs> thank you. I don't see any particular questions at this point. Uh, uh, Beverly, uh, again, I deeply appreciate your making the time for us this morning and uh, look forward to being able to stay in touch as we move forward uh, together on this, uh, on this ho hopefully a bill that we can move forward and can make a difference. Thank you very much for, for taking the time to hear me and thank you for taking the time to work on this. Apologies, I see Representative Chena does have a hand up and uh, Representative Chena, if you if you can take a minute more, uh, Beverly, we'll, yes, we'll hear I can. Representative Chena. Okay, thank you. Thanks for making time out of your busy schedule to join us today. Um, I'm, I feel like I need to ask you a really difficult question and put you on the spot. I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> so, um, so a question I have for you is you mentioned um, how things, you, you, there was a theme in your testimony about how we underfund our priorities. Like we ask people to do work and then we don't fund it. And a piece of this bill there, it talks about this commission being given the powers and duties to look at how to expand grants to the to communities who are facing health disparities. And in the bill, it identifies BIPOC, LGBTQ plus and people with disabilities. And I'm curious if you have any thoughts uh, um, about how you know, if we were going to give grants out, what might some of that those investments look like based on your experience in the state? Like, are you aware of any efforts out there being um, in the community doing this work? Or uh, have you have any thoughts about what are some of those gaps we might fill or fund better? I think that one of the, the big gaps that I see is in those communities, it's sometimes difficult to um, navigate applying for these grants. They are sometimes written so confusing that those communities that need them the most don't apply for them, or they apply for them and they're not written in the way that the grantor wants to hear. And especially in the indigenous communities, uh, we are not traditionally a hierarchical uh, group of people. And so a lot of the grants are written in a hierarchical manner. And the questions that they ask, uh, we have difficulty in responding to those questions because they're so out of context with what we know culturally. And so providing, in addition to access to those grants, providing assistance in navigating those grants, providing uh, some sort of resources that people can go to to help learn how to write a grant, learn how to, what do you want to see in a budget? All of, all of those little nuances. It's easy to say, yes, we're gonna write a bill that's gonna um, create access to grants. 
good. We've done something good. We've, we've created a bill and uh, it says that now BIPOC people will have access to these. And that's where it ends. It has to be carried through all the way through. And I think that, you know, our, our success lies with our youth. It lies with our young people. And those are the people that we need to start educating to know how to um, sit in the places that you're sitting, Brian. To sit on committees like you're all sitting on. Yes, I'm an elder, I'm not a spring chicken. So I'm looking towards you as you're looking towards the next generation, the next generation. The Lakota believe that we stand on the backs of seven generations ahead of us and that we provide a pathway for seven generations to come. So those are things that are needed when we write a bill. We need to think ahead and we can learn from those that have gone before us. Does that answer your question? Uh, it begins to answer the question, but I think the, that your, your answer to the question brings up the point that there's many more questions that need to be answered and that aren't gonna be resolved just in one bill and that there's a lot of work ahead of us and this is just one step. That's what I'm getting from what you're saying. Yes, this is just one step. This is one step and there is a lot of work to do. This disparity did not occur overnight. We're looking at the last three or 400 years that have created where we stand today. And it's gonna take time to undo that. And it's going to require looking at many, many facets of the society in which we live in. Again, uh, thank you for, thank you Representative Chena for asking a question which uh, gives us more information about what we need to think about as well as we move forward with crafting uh, responses to health disparities. Um, and I, if I may, I might say that when this committee advocated for uh, some substantial dollars in granting at, at when COVID money was available last year. Uh, I wish we could have turned to a group such as this bill proposes to create, which is a commission made up of affected communities to have made decisions about how to disperse those monies. Uh, unfortunately, what we discovered, of course, was that there was no such structure available. And I think your comments uh, add, uh, amplify some of what we what was discovered as well is that if you if you're wanting to give grants uh, or award grants if you don't have the infrastructure or the uh, to the organization uh, to use the dollars or the ability to even uh, the not not the innate ability but the technical ability to access the parameters of the grant. Uh, there's another barrier right there. And so there, I, appreciate, I appreciate your articulation of those issues. That's very important. And something that was painfully discovered in the effort to move large dollars uh, before December 30th of last year as well. Some of it successfully and some of it not as successful as many of us had hoped. But again, thank you and uh, acknowledge that this is the beginning or not the begin, not just the beginning, because there's so much work that's been done, but this is a next step. This is a next step, hopefully, in moving things forward. So with that, uh, again, thank you. Thank you, Beverly. I, I, I personally very much appreciate uh, greeting you today and having you join us in our committee this morning. So thank you very much. Thank you and have a great day. Thank you. Thank you so much. So we're going to continue uh, with our witnesses. And before I welcome and introduce our next witness, I want to just again say to the committee, it may not be clear from what is in front of us today, but a lot of work went into inviting 
the witnesses we have here before us. Uh, and these witnesses, including our next witness, were willing to join us on extremely short notice. Uh, and uh, we are very grateful. Uh, and our next witness who is with us is Andrea Brett. Again, we have not met in person, I don't believe, Andrea, but I'm glad to have you here, even on our virtual Zoom, in our Zoom committee room of the House Health Care Committee, and look forward to the time when we can actually say hello in person. Um, Andrea, I'm going to ask you to introduce yourself, but my understanding, and, but uh, Susanna Davis, who's with us, by the way, on Zoom, but not as a witness this morning, but as a resource, um, uh, brought your name uh, forward as someone we should hear from, who also serves uh, on the advisory panel, as I understand it, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, but an advisory panel uh, to the Director of Racial Equity for the state. So I, I believe you may chair that. But let me introduce, welcome you and have you introduce yourself both in terms of your official roles and more personal as you wish to. So thank you. Um, thank you for having me here today. Uh, like others uh, who have testified, I am sitting here in my office. I am lucky enough to have a boss who supports me in doing this and taking this time away um, to do this type of work. Um, and I do sit on the Vermont Commission for Native American Affairs, and I also do chair the Racial Equity Advisory Panel. Um, and my, and I also am an Abenaki Vermonter, and um, I was trying to decide if I should be presumptuous enough to introduce myself in Abenaki versus English. And um, welcome you too. I welcome you. Kwai kwai in Diluizi and and Lea, and um, there are no R's in Abenaki, so the R becomes L, which I actually like that in Abenaki better. Uh, and so to get into everything, there's, um, I've tried to make sure that I've looked through the bill, highlighted stuff, and I have the in an enviable position of being last and <laughs> with trying to be articulate. So listening to others' testimony, uh, Judy, uh, with what she's talking about, um, I, I let me back up a minute. I also do work for the University of Vermont Medical Center. I am a case manager in the outpatient realm. I work with a, we're under the free clinics for Vermont um, designation for um, the under and uninsured Vermonters. So as we're talking about this bill, it's something that is very near and dear to my heart. I see and hear these stories every day. Uh, and I, get to touch even remotely so many Vermonters lives from our older Vermonters who have farmed their whole lives to those Vermonters who they are poor, they will be statistically looked at as poor white. And I will challenge you to hold in your mind that they are most likely Abenaki and they will not tell you. Um, I was urged even growing up to, I can pass, to pass, do not tell anyone. My family has, was also affected by the Vermont Eugenics Survey. Um, my paternal grandfather, when the state would come through to gather up the children, to take them away, the first round, they didn't know what was going on. And then um, they started, they would get word that the state was coming through and they would spirit the children away. So the they, they couldn't find, they wouldn't be able to find them. And then when they knew that the officials were gone, they would bring the children out. Um, my father was ill as a child and also sent away. And it took my grandparents um, more years than they cared to, they did, it took them longer to get him back than they expected. Um, so there, here I am working in a healthcare in the healthcare realm and never thought I'd be here because I am one of those Abenaki Vermonters who I was 10 before I could trust the police. Um, and I 
have those living memories of not trusting the doctors, not trusting the healthcare system, not trusting law enforcement. It's, I understand law enforcement's not in this discussion. Um, my son uh, has a disability. He will not access healthcare because every time he tries, he's told it's his anxiety when the anxiety is created because of his disability. So uh, there's that piece of it. Um, there's the mental health piece of it. Uh, he, does, he should be seeing a counselor to manage, just to, to refresh and keep his tools up to date. He does not trust the mental health system. Um, it, so there's all these, and also I am not recognized by a tribe. Uh, just so you know, I am also one of those Abenaki Vermonters who I do not have tribal affiliation. Um, and there has been so much um, controversy with Abenaki through the years that uh, I choose at this time to not be affiliated with the tribe. Um, I don't want to feel that because I have tribal affiliation that I would have to have allegiance to that tribe versus all Abenaki and indigenous people in Vermont. Um, and when, I forget who mentioned it about, I think it was Dawn for the COBRA, that's actually over a thousand dollars a month now for most people. Um, dental care is a huge need. There is nothing affordable about Vermont Health Connect. There is nothing affordable about those plans. The hoops that people have to go through in order to see if they qualify for subsidies does not work. Most people cannot, even with subsidies, afford the monthly premium unless they also have some type of steady employment. And then yes, there is Medicaid, thank goodness. And through COVID, an awful lot of people went on to Medicaid. Um, the, and Medicaid does cover now about $1,000 in dental care. That said, they still would prefer to yank those teeth versus preserve those teeth. And their Medicare and Medicaid do not provide for replacing teeth. It's like there's just no care of, dental care is also health care. Uh, like Beverly said, and you will have a thriving economy if you have healthy Vermonters. Um, this is a great bill. I support it. It does need work. Uh, like so many of my previous folks, the folk, previous folks who testified, um, people also are overwhelmed with navigating the healthcare system. They're overwhelmed with navigating access to Vermont Health Connect, how and how, so many calls that I deal with on a daily basis with trying to get the healthcare coverage and that they are always like, what would I do if I didn't have you? They, the website is not uh, clear. We do have our immigrant refugee population, um, the migrant workers, there's, I have, you know, I'm looking at, I'm trying to keep track of all my notes as well. You, the, you will be looking at those poor Vermonters who may be passing as white where you are looking at those health disparities. And um, I know Don mentioned AstraZeneca. I also um, have been part of the AstraZeneca vaccine trial um, for the much of the same reason is that I'm trying to show people that we are in a different time and can trust the healthcare system. Um, I, I'm, uh, the access to insurance, the, and also um, Judy mentioned the two hours of additional training, totally not sufficient. Um, I don't know, so we just did a survey for equity, diversity, and inclusion in the hospital, and our LGBTQ plus workers do not feel that they have the same support as we reported in the survey that we offer to the patients coming through our door. And even that I would challenge um, because I see and hear too many stories every day. Um, it's a great start. Uh, I don't have, I know there's also lots of statistics in here, my own family stories with the healthcare system. Um, and that trust, the barriers also for trust. How can we get 
um, respected and trusted voices out to the community. You, you will find that the community will engage if the folks who are engaging with them, they also have a level of trust, rapport and respect for. Um, and if you don't have that, you can roll this bill out for, for every year for 50 years and it's not gonna make a difference. Um, so I feel like I've been all over the place. Uh, I don't know. I've been trying to keep track of all my notes as I'm talking. I'll stop. <laughs> mute myself. Oh. Right. Uh, again, sorry, I was on mute. Um, th again, thank you. Uh, you touched on a number of important issues. Uh, can, can I ask just, this is a broad question for which there's not going to be, I think, a clear answer, but you mentioned without trust, without establishing and reestablishing the trust for um, many communities. And that goes for many of the impacted communities where there's health disparities. But I, I would welcome any thoughts that you could offer on particularly reestablishing trust within the communities of uh, Native people in Vermont. That's a good question. Um, you have within the recognized tribes, you have members and leaders who are known, trusted, and that within the recognized tribes, people will engage. For those of us who are not affiliated with a tribe, it will take, it will be more difficult to try to find who their people, who the people are in their communities that they tend to reach out to. Who do they go to? Who do they trust? And to try to uh, get that word out there because it will trigger that, oh, this is the state. And, um, and you also, um, to touch on what Brian said, um, Representative Chena, um, uh, universal health care, can we roll it out well? Can we, could we do that? Can we roll it out in such a way that would maybe mimic Norway or uh, some of the Scandinavian countries versus the UK, um, uh, which has some really good aspects and then other aspects of it are very broken um, because we're a smaller state. Um, it, it would really be taking that work, which would be very, could would be hard work to find those the trusted people in around the state who are trusted in their communities for folks to go to to get that word out that this is a good thing. Thank you. And I think I just there's clearly such a recognition that the that the challenges in front of us are so much greater and broader than this bill that's immediately in front of us, but that um, I continue to take the point of view, which I believe I hear you saying, or uh, some others saying, we have to take steps that keep moving us forward. Uh, some of the challenges, the very real challenges of full access to healthcare um, may be beyond our reach. Uh, and, um, well, I'll comment perhaps later to say that uh, we have we are reaching out to a group of advisors who have been helpful to us as the House Health Care Committee and the Senate Health and Welfare Committee in the past uh, around federal changes that are some of which are in process right now. I believe today, in fact, uh, the House of Representatives is doing the final vote on the uh, uh, I'm not sure what term to use, but the, the, the COVID response package that is that just passed the Senate is now back in the House. And Congressman Welsh uh, joined this morning, for those who might not have been aware, but Congressman Welsh joined the Legislative Social Equity Caucus um, to talk about some of that. And so while some of the needs that you've described and others I think do go beyond the reach of what we're able to do in this committee at this time. We want to work carefully uh, to, to build on the initiatives that now can be initiated and are being initiated at the federal level as well. Mm -hmm. So this, it's, it's a, but that does not mean that we wait on this bill uh, 
in order to move things forward on the ground here in Vermont, from my point of view. Uh, and I would also stress the two extra hours that that needs to be a continual training, not only of their own self, but of um, other cultures. Right. And, uh, as I say, there, there we, we've heard testimony from numbers of people, yourself included, and others this morning, and we will be modifying the bill in different ways to try to take next steps. Uh, and some of this is some of this we can integrate some of your thoughts and others we can integrate into a new version of the bill. But again, even that will be a next step, not a full full achievement of what we're hoping for longer term. Thank you. Are, are there other questions? Uh, Representative Page and Representative China. Yes, I was curious. Um, has has the state or the federal government ever um, offered a um, an apology? I, I think the nat maybe nationally uh, it has uh, to indigenous peoples. Um, do you know anything about that? Um, I know that. Um, well, I know that as the state, there is, has been um, uh, an apology that the commission is also involved with with um, the state. I'm not sure um, the status of that right now. I don't know the status of that right now. Um, the, can chair, do you have do you have? Some yes. Could I just could I just step in and say that. Uh, we uniquely have uh, uh, one of our members, our vice chair, Representative Donahue, uh, introduced a bill a number of years ago to initiate an apology uh, for the eugenics impact on Vermonters. Uh, I joined that effort some years later, and uh, a number there is an there is active consideration of that in in our sister committee, uh, the general committee. General Housing and Military Affairs Committee uh, during this session, uh, but there's you know, trying to be thoughtful about how to move forward with an appropriate level. I, I would welcome Representative Donahue uh, again. I didn't mean to speak for you, but I do want to acknowledge uh, your uh, groundbreaking work in having set something in motion a few years ago, which really undergirds what's happening now. But, uh, thank you. Yes, just to add a little bit to that, um, I think the committee is quite close to finishing its work, and um, I was going to apologize to the chair for missing the first 15 minutes of this afternoon's testimony because I've been asked to, to testify to that committee in the, the progress on that um, specific effort to an apology to all those affected by the eugenics uh, movement in, in Vermont. Um, Yes, and I, and I think you can see, I, I'm just going to take the liberty to just say that the intersection of different efforts are very important. We, you cannot have heard the testimony this morning from uh, Native people of Vermont to not be profoundly aware that the eugenics movement and the eugenics activities in Vermont have had a profound and lasting impact on uh, Native communities of Vermont. And so. And I'll add, I just um, forwarded to our committee um, the materials that are the basis of, of, will be of my testimony and some of the background in originally um, introducing this, because another number of other states have done this already. And so right. you folks have that in your box. Uh, again, I'm going to, again, take the liberty to say that. Um, the intersection of some of the issues, such as uh, Andrea mentioned and others about the training, cultural competency, cultural awareness for medical providers, uh, has to also include an understanding of the history of mistrust with healthcare providers themselves. So to come into the healthcare system in 2021 and not be aware of what has happened in the past that has broken trust for very important communities would leave you unaware and you know, unable 
and the result as a result of the failure to have us know about some of these know about some of this it's it's hard to fault someone for not knowing something that they've never been told uh, so we and i will include myself as someone who's still learning and continuing to learn and continuing to be heartbroken at the level of hurt that has been imposed on uh, native communities as well as other communities and some communities that some of us are a part of as well. There's much more for us all to know. Uh, that we could we could take that and run with it for a long time here. And I think at this point, uh, Representative Page, thank you for asking the question that prompts the ability to comment some of, on some of this because it, it's, it's, it's important for our committee to be aware in the context of what we're doing here on this bill uh, as well. It's a part of this bill. Uh, Representative Chena, uh, and I, again, I wanna be respectful of Andrea's time, but uh, I welcome you to make a, have, pose a question or make a comment. Representative Chena. Hakwa um, Noizian, Itsi Uliuni, Ta Kulaluka, Ta Uli Nana Walmazi. It's, uh, Good to see you, or you appear new to me. Um, yep. Great, thanks, and good job. And that you continue <laughs> to <look> well. Really, Oni. Onda kagui. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Representative China. Thank you, Andrea. Uh, it's important for us to hear the the language of people who are with us in Vermont, a uh, language we don't most of us, or many of us, don't get to hear on a, any regular basis. Okay, with that, uh, any, final, any final comment that you wish to make, Andrew, before we move to our next uh, part of our work this morning? No, thank any you so much for comment? having, thank you so much for having me. Okay, uh, thank you. So yeah, I want okay. to... <laughs> Is it good for me to leave now? Uh, you're, you're welcome to stay and go off video. I'm going to make a few quick announcements for the committee. Uh, I, I will also say that, and for you to hear, uh, uh, I'm, I'm trying to juggle too many machines here in front of me. <laughs> but uh, if people would give me one minute, uh, I wanted to convey a greeting from, uh, oh, here it is. Uh, so if I may, I'd like to uh, read into the record uh, a comment from uh, Rich Holshu, who is the spokesperson for the Elnu Abnaki in Vermont, uh, who has talked with the chief of the Elnu Abnaki, uh, but they could not be with us this morning but he sent me an email and I said I would read, I would read it into the record. Um, um, Chair Lippert, thank you for the invitation to testify on behalf of Elnu Abnaki in regard to H210. And thank you for our conversation by phone just now. We spoke by phone. I would like to affirm that Elnu as a Vermont state recognized tribe would be in support of the premises and objectives of this bill as substantially as substantively drafted. It is well understood within the native community that access to the broad benefits of citizenship are not in fact equitable. These social disparities can manifest in many ways, all of which affect the ability to lead fulfilling and healthful lives within one's own culture and community. While I do not feel I can speak in a well-informed manner on the particulars of this bill, I do appreciate the committee's intention to include native voices. And with that, he made several suggestions of folks we could continue to reach out to. And he greeted me and uh, gave me a salutation in uh, the native language. I will not try to read it and probably mispronounce those greetings in the salutation. 
but that's from uh, Rich Holshu, who is the spokesperson for the El New Abenaki in Vermont. And I said I would share that with the committee. I also want to say that, that I reached out over the last day, several days, to the other recognized tribes in Vermont and Chief Shirley Hook was going to join us this morning, but was unable to because of a family emergency. And others had conflicts because of previously scheduled work. So, um, but I did want the committee to know that I'd reached out to each of the uh, recognized tribes in Vermont to invite their participation this morning. At this point, I'm going to suggest a break for our committee. And uh, I'm sorry, Representative China. Yes. Um, how long is the break so that I can, so that yeah. we can plan how to maximize the use yeah. of the time we're given? Yeah, I'm trying to think that through. Right. <laughs> give, give me a minute. Uh, it's a very real, a very good question. Um, Actually, uh, let me think out loud here for a minute. Um, our next witness is not scheduled till 11 o'clock. And we're gonna be shifting gears here. The witnesses we've heard from this morning have been witnesses from the native communities of Vermont in order for us to learn about health disparities and also get feedback on this bill, uh, H210. At 11 o'clock, uh, we are scheduled to hear from Wilda White, who is going to provide some feedback on the bill as well from the Racial Justice Alliance, of which the group that she's part of, uh, Mad Freedom, is part of that alliance. And um, one thought would be for us to take a substantial break uh, between now and perhaps uh, just before 11. Uh, that would allow each one of us to attend to some other things that are in front of us. I don't, uh, uh, we had some other witnesses who had to not be, with, who were not with us this morning as a result of conflicts or had to cancel. And so I think that's what my suggestion is going to be, that we take a break now and come back as a committee at, um, five minutes to, or 10 minutes, five, they say between five and 10 minutes to 11. Uh, and I communicated with uh, Wilda White, she'll be available, I think, to join us at 11. But if we could be on, yes, our agenda says 1115. Thank you, I note that. Uh, but I spoke with her this morning and uh, in anticipation that we might be able to move her testimony up and she indicated 11 was the earliest she could join us today, but she is planning to join us at 11. So I think, uh, yeah, that's, that's gonna be my proposal. And I think that responds to what your question was, Representative China, that will give you and others time to attend to other things that are pressing, plus get a chance to stretch, maybe even walk outside for a moment. I understand it's a sunny day most places, and that it's actually the temperature is rising to a, in, a, in a way that we have not experienced for a long time. Uh, before we go, Representative Golden has a question. Thank you. Um, I'm just curious, you know, we're taking testimony in H210. Um, what, what's the process as we take more and more testimony? Just we, so I understand how to think about it. Thank you. Yes. yes. Uh, based on the testimony that we've taken, uh, I'm going to be, I am in the process of trying to work on a tentative redraft that we then would put for, put before the committee for review and further input. Uh, my experience is that that's, the, that's often the best next step rather than trying to have the committee redraft as a group. Uh, but, that, but again, that redraft that uh, will be put together uh, is not, going to be put forward as a final product, but as, it, and it will be shared with you. Uh, I'm, there's a lot, a lot of pieces to do between now and when we need to achieve our goal. But that, that is the next step from my point of view. 
May I ask a follow-up? You may. Uh, you, you just said we need to achieve our goal. Is there a time frame of wanting to achieve that goal? Crossover is the end of the day on Friday. So that's what we're aiming for crossover. I just wanted to make that clear. Thank you. We're aiming for crossover and we're thinking about what that means. So there's much in much at not much at play here. And that's why if you look at our agenda, uh, tomorrow we are coming back to uh, 104, where I think we can bring closure because we've had previous committee discussions. We're going to go through a draft. Um, I don't have everything in front of me, but I think, uh, oh, we're also going to be hearing, it's interesting, one of the issues that was touched on today was access to health care for uh, Vermonters whose immigrant status does not allow them to have access to health care, and we've started that process. We'll be hearing more about that tomorrow morning uh, to try to take that a next step and see whether there is anything that we can do at this point in time. Uh, and then the, the red, I have I've tentatively put everything else on the schedule is S210 between now and the end of the day, Friday, uh, because we're going to need that time Thank for, you. for committee discussion and, and secure residential testimony this afternoon. H210. Did I say S again? I don't know why. There must have been an S210 in my past somewhere. Uh, but yes, H210. Yeah. Thank you for asking, Representative Goldman. That, that, you, you have another question. It's, it's a similar question on um, the Middlesex facility. What, what's the time frame that we have to come together with our thoughts? I am in touch with the chair of the House Institutions and Corrections Committee uh, this morning again. And we are going to need to put some time set aside. We're going to find some time in the midst of all what we're doing for some committee discussion. That is also a complex and challenging issue. Uh, and um, I'll be honest and say my hope and my goal is that for me, uh, that we might be able to have some opportunity at the very beginning of next week, if we can't find our way through that this week, because the, the capital bill needs to be completed by that committee, not by this crossover, but by the following Friday. But I've been in communication with, the, with Chair Emmons. She recognizes and shares some of the questions that we have. And we are doing a lot of the initial work in order to be able to give a recommendation to her committee. Um, uh, just to say, so, so that other people, we are also, I'm anticipating, oh, in fact, uh, Representative Houghton, uh, well, I guess we're, we're, let's do this. We're in the midst of some, this is a, this is a good time. We have a little bit of time here for some updates actually. Uh, Representative Houghton, do you want to give us an update on the status of the bill that has audio only? Uh, not not to get into deep details, but to the process of where we are so the committee, other committee members are aware of that as well. Yes, so it was voted out of Senate Health and Welfare yesterday at 5-0. Uh, um, I have not looked to see, I'm assuming it's on notice calendar today for the Senate, but I actually have not looked. So we will obviously be getting that at some point in the future. Fingers crossed. <laughs> yeah, so today is Wednesday, I believe. Right. <laughs> Keep track of myself. So that means that we may not receive that, well, we will likely not receive that bill for action until the first part of next week. We've begun to look at the agenda. The first part of next week also needs to include closure on that bill. Um, I don't know that it has a number yet. Maybe it does because they- It's actually uh, not on the Senate calendar. Okay. So, but just but just to alert committee members and interested parties that we will turn to that bill as soon as we can uh, early next week because it has a doesn't have a crossover deadline. It has a deadline to get to the governor before March 31st when there's a lot of deadlines. So we need to get it out of our committee to the House floor. And then depending on what what that entails, uh, Hopefully you can go directly to the governor, depend, depending on what we receive, um, because the governor's staff is going to need a chance to review the bill itself in order to the governor to consider hopefully signing the bill or recommending further changes uh, before the March 31st deadline, which is there are many deadlines for emergency COVID extensions that we have talked about in the past. 
Okay. And um, and the next today, I understand as well as next week is going to be filled with bills coming out of other committees. So we're going to be on the House floor much more than we have been previously, and that's going to limit some of our time in committee. So we we may need to meet early again or meet late in order to achieve our goals. So I'll be trying my best to manage all that and letting you know and consulting with you. So I think with that, I think I'd still recommend that we take our break, which is not quite as long as it might have been, but, but I think this is good to give us an update. Thank you for asking the questions that helped me remember to update our committee on where we are in our process. So let's now then uh, go off YouTube and uh,